we are very honored to have with us here on the show Chris Bernadell, who is a member of the Haiti Committee of the Black Alliance for Peace. Shout out to BAP. Also joined by Jamima Pierre, who is a associate professor of African American Studies and Anthropology at UCLA, and also with the Black Alliance for Peace. So breakthrough and BAP linking up here on Haiti. Chris, Jamima, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having me. me. Well, the pleasure is all ours. Uh, Jamima, I'll start with you. And this is obviously a fast moving situation. There's a lot happening there. Uh, One of the things that has been notable to me is this shootout that happened, the killing of the alleged assassins. And uh, uh, to me, it just seems so indicative of everything that they're like, yeah, these are these mercenaries who are coming in. We don't know who they are. And then allegedly they find them and they end up dead. And we still don't know. I mean, the level of dissembling from the so-called government in Haiti uh, is is notable. I'm curious what you think about this interim government, what it represents, uh, and, and, and what it means, the state of emergency they've put in. Okay, that's a lot. Um, yeah. But yes, the, <laughs> the, the, the interim government is not an interim government. It's illegitimate the same way that the government before it was illegitimate, so that we have to start with that, right? That um, what's fascinating um, uh, and people have been thinking of talking about is the fact that the the guy called Joseph who declared himself president um, was supposed to step down on the day that he declared himself president because he was going to be replaced by a Dr. Ariel Henry um, who was actually going, was forced to be, he was, Henri was, uh, Moise was forced by the OAS to actually name a new prime minister. And so this guy was an interim prime minister from April, un- called, you know, called Joseph, from April until the day before yesterday. And sure enough, Moise gets assassinated on the night and he declares himself president. And then all of a sudden, he, also he declared a state of siege, which is like martial law. And we have to be very worried about that because what that means is airports are closed, um, military tribunals instead of regular courts, protests are frowned upon. And so on. And I don't know if you you all have been on air, but just a few minutes ago, the United Nations are, you know, what I what I call our white rulers of Haiti. Mm. The United Nations um, office has affirmed his his uh, assertion that he will lead the country and then will hold it until, you know, will lead it until these elections in September 26, which actually already goes against the Constitution, because even if you have an interim president, it's only a 90 day, uh, it's only a, you have, you have 90 days to start the elections. And so Haiti, you know, the, the situation is really terrible and untenable, and I'm not sure it would actually quiet the, the masses of people who've been asking for, um, you know, Moïse to step down and for a return of the, of sovereignty and, and democracy. And so this is where we are in the international community. So, you know, which are the UN, the core group, the OAS that run, Haiti that makes a decision, I think, you know, they knew all of, uh, there's nothing that happens in Haiti without them knowing. So we have to also question their position in this and how they're quickly jumping on the called Joseph bandwagon. No, I and think I can go such... on, but I think this is, you know, a good opening salvo for us to really talk about what's going on in Haiti. No, I think that's so important. And thank you for that UN news. I mean, I, well, people who watch Breakthrough no, I, I had the, the pleasure of being in Haiti for eight days at the end of March and early April, and you you couldn't find anyone, no matter where you went, no matter who you talked to, who thought that the referendum or the September elections were in any way legitimate. And so to see the so-called United Nations speaking, the disgusting on so many levels. Um, Chris, let me ask you this, and I think it speaks very much to what Jamima was laying out with the UN there. I mean, how... What level of of concern should we have about U.S. intervention? I mean, they're obviously intervening all day, every day. But, you know, troops on the ground, boots on the ground from the U.S. I know Colombia has called for OAS intervention. I mean, is this something people should be watching for or expecting that could happen? Yes, I would say so. Uh, Allies of the Haitian people have to remain vigilant because if you look at our history or the history of the Haitian people, uh, the last time we had a president assassinated and the political turmoil that followed it, the U.S. used it as a pretext to invade the country, raid the treasury, force the constitution to be rewritten, 
and to occupy the country for 19 years, from 1915 to 1934. Um, a lot of what we're seeing uh, now with these, um, you know, what people are saying are plots and different things uh, can represent, you know, something that's plagued uh, Haiti throughout its history also, which is uh, splits amongst the Haitian ruling class, splits amongst Haiti's comprador bourgeoisie that's been placed in charge of Haiti by its neo-colonial masters, the U.S., the U.N. core group, the OAS. So what we're seeing now, um, you know, with this uh, prime minister, now president, or de facto president, Claude Joseph, could be a representation of that playing out again. You know, I think that's a very good point. And, and Jamima, I'm curious what you think about that. I mean, obviously, we can only speculate but so much. But I think you laid out the, the, the sequence of events very well about this so-called president supposed to be gone, declares himself president in the w wake of this. I mean, does it feel like the assassination of Jovenel was sort of a no honor amongst thieves kind of situation? Yes, I mean, it's starting to, I mean, we're all speculating, so let's just be clear here, but it is starting to seem like it was an inside job um, or, or some kind of internal um, 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 dissent or dissension within that group. And, and some people are even calling it a coup. Um, because it, it's like one wing of the party going against the other because they might not want that. And so we have to be um, very careful about the speculation, but it is it does seem that way. I, I wanted to just quickly say, though, about intervention is that, you know, and I'm sure you, you all have covered this already, there is already a foreign presence in Haiti. Haiti is under occupation. And Haiti has been under occupation since 2004 when the UN, when the US, Canada, and France came in, took out our president, and flew him to Africa, and then sent all these troops, and then convinced the United Nations Security Council to send an occupation force, which is still there, which is the same UN occupation force, even though the numbers have diminished since 1919, they removed a lot of the military there. But there's a human, um, there's a UN force, a uh, political office, integrated office, that controls the narrative, that controls what happens. And that's the office that uh, declared today that this is our president. And so intervention would mean, I guess, more military and more political interference. But the truth is they control Haiti and they have controlled Haiti. And, and, and I think that, that that's an important thing to, to, for us to remember, because nothing happens there under occupation without their knowledge. No, I think that's an extraordinarily important point. When I was there on Constitution Day, the same morning of the big protest, the national police were in the U.S. Embassy meeting with them about the security of the country. And it was just, I mean, if it wasn't so deadly serious, it would be laughable, but it is so right. deadly serious. And I, and I think, you know, Chris, that's one of the things that I think is, is deeply important about all of this is the level of repression that has been visited on the popular movement of Haiti has been massive. And of course, every news agency on earth is now talking about Haiti. But, you know, when we were there just a few months ago, it was like a conspiracy of silence, at least here in the United States, about these brutal massacres of protesters. Yes, massacres of protesters have been a common occurrence, um, even more so in these last few months. Uh, but even going back to the Petro Caribe protest that began against Jovenel Moise soon after he came into office, uh, this has been commonplace, and the people of Haiti are being held hostage even still to this day and don't feel safe taking the streets because of the fact that massacres occur and these gangs are allowed to roam the streets and attack people with, in, with apparent impunity. It certainly seemed apparent. I, uh, when we were there in Bel Air, it was, I mean, the stories people were telling us were, I mean, you know, people being burned and stabbed and shot and houses burned down. And it was really, it was notable. Rania, I see you trying to get in there, but point well taken. Oh, no, no. I, I'm just, you know, um, all three of you know so much about Haiti. Um, and I'm curious, and I kind of opened this to all of you, including you, Eugene, because all we can do is speculate. But since this assassination happened, the question is who benefits? So I'd like to hear from you guys, you know, from your vantage point, who benefits? Doesn't mean they did it, but you know, it, it does maybe point in a certain direction. Who benefits from this assassination? And what does it mean for these protests that were taking place um, in the aftermath of this? 
Jamie, why don't you start? Yeah, well, who, okay. Let's start with who doesn't benefit, and that that's the Haitian people and Haitian sovereignty. So, that's so right. that you know, get that out of the way. But you know, who benefits besides you know um, the, the the interim prime minister now president and his and his people, but really the international so-called international community, the U.S., the U.N., the OAS, and out of that the core group, because. Moise was increasingly sidelined and was so, you know, was so difficult to deal with because there's so much hatred of his policies, of him. The violence around him was so great. You know, just last weekend, the 30, you know, 19 people were murdered in Delma 32, right? Um, in, in one day, and the US government said nothing, you know, and it was just really fascinating. So, 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 so part of that is Moise must have been, might have been too much for them to push for what they want. And this, this guy, Claude Joseph, what I'm finding out is that he's been around for a while. You know, he has a PhD from a university in, in, in the US. He's been working, uh, funded through the um, National Endowment for Democracy. We know that's not about democracy. And so we, he has a long history with the US. And so we have to think about, well, was he the one that they've decided would replace Moise to continue the process of controlling 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 Haiti, and but controlling Haiti for very specific things, because we also have to worry about the narratives that are starting to spin, right? So on the one hand, you have these mercenaries, but then they're speaking Spanish and people are trying to link them to Venezuela, right? So then you have the former corrupt prime minister, Long Lamont, saying, you know, these are Venezuelans, Venezuelan nationals. So we have to think about what this means so for the for the U.S. and 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 the U.N. and the O.S. to have control of Haiti, what it means then for like broader U.S. foreign policy, O.S. For, you know right wing policy in the Western Hemisphere, and then of course U.S. having access to the Panama Canal to Asia, right? And so there is a really important geopolitical um, um, strategy here that we have to really focus on, and how Haiti then becomes central to that for for these Western powers. Mm -hmm. Chris, your thoughts. Well, yes, I agree with Jemima. Um, the Haitian people are not gaining anything from this situation. And it seems to be just another pretext for the U.S. and the other imperial forces, uh, the OAS, the core group, to increase their influence over the political situation, the political process of Haiti. And with Claude Joseph staying on until these elections, like Jemima mentioned at the beginning, this new administration or this new form of the administration is just as illegitimate as the old Jovenel Moise administration was two days ago. So that hasn't changed at all. And there hasn't been anything that's shown that they are committed to increasing the Haitian people's input, the Haitian people's control over this process of transition that the, the Haitian people have been calling for. They've been calling for a people's transition, a transition where the civil society, the masses of Haitian people can take part and control the process. And that's not what's been going on. The United States, the UN core group, OAS, has been supporting the PHTK regime and have continue, are going to continue to support, to support through Claude Joseph, this neo-colonial system that they've imposed on Haiti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly can I, can't add can anything I, analytically. Uh, Jamima, go ahead. No, and I have to say, you know, the thing about what will determine intervention, like more military, is how Haitian people respond to this, right? So with the state of siege, protests are going to be completely curtailed, right? And, and we don't know how long the state of siege will go, but it also means that if, if the UN is basically our masters are telling us that we, did, we have to September 26, if people start protesting, they're gonna use that as a pretext for bringing military um, reinforcement to uphold Claude Joseph. And that's what we have to worry about, and we have to be concerned about um, um, for for the Haitian people. No, that's that's I mean that's so important. I remember when we were there, we got like an alert on our phone from the U.S. Embassy that was like, "There are protests happening in Haiti. Don't go out into the streets. The protests can." I, I'm trying to remember exactly what they said. It was like they can take a a rapid turn to aggressive violence or I mean it was I mean you really would have thought it was the worst situation you were ever walking into and it, I mean it was again it's one of those things if it wasn't so deadly serious it'd be funny because then you're there in the middle of the protest and it's 
it's just the exact opposite in every possible way in terms of who was there, why people was there, the feelings, everything about it. But the U.S. has so much discursive power. And so you can already see how the ability of the U.S. Embassy to just criminalize protests that easy to all Americans in the country for whatever they may be and how that can be carried and, and misconstrued. And, and I think that's the only other thing I would just slightly say, I think, for people watching in the U.S. that I think is often lost because of just the racism and the coverage of Haiti is that Haiti is a geostrategically important country. And it's never presented that way, but a huge amount of wealth is being extracted from Haiti. The geopolitical issues in terms of its location as an island. And, you know, I'll throw another one in there, big supporters of Taiwan. And you, there aren't that many supporters of Taiwan anywhere in the world anymore. So that has a lot of value, I think, to the United States as, as well. And, you know, maybe my, my follow-up question on, on that very note is, uh, I'm curious both your thoughts about this, and certainly, Jamima, I'll start with you. I mean, what are what should people be expecting from the popular movement? Should they be expecting to, to see things continue? Again, we're just speculating, um, but, but certainly it's been shaking the whole country for months now. I mean, does it seem like this could quell it or that uh, people will continue to come out and make their mark? I think people will continue to come out and make their mark. I think, you know, I mean, that's that's been Haiti for 217 years, right? So, um, you know, it's it's been a struggle. It's been a long struggle. And I think this guy was even more illegitimate, illegitimate because, you know, he was like, he's the, the sixth, the fifth prime minister uh, assigned by Moise. And people know this. And so he still represents the Moise government. And, and I think part of that is going to be how much repression they're allowed to get away with. And I, and, 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 and I, but I don't think people will stop it because people think the elections are illegitimate. The uh, electoral council is illegitimate. The government is illegitimate and the UN is illegitimate, right? Because one of the things that people have, we have to remember is that in March, the protests were not just about Moise. They were about the imperial um, um, uh, meddling in Haiti. You know, all the signs where UN get out, you know, US leave us alone. The U.S. is racist. And so I, th I think, you know, I think people are going to protest and people know what's going on. And they hate that that woman, Helen Laline, who's in charge of the U.N. And they've said that. And so, I'm, you know, I'm just hoping that we don't have as many deaths and massacres as we've had before, um, you know, in the past two years, because, you know, people are not going to sit taking this. Mm -hmm. A quick bit of news that was just sent to me here uh, relevant to this, I guess. One of the people allegedly the suspect in the assassination seems to be a U.S. citizen. Um, Washington Post reporting that. We'll see that. Well, you know, Chris, I'm curious your thoughts as well um, about maybe some of what people may expect. And, and I'll add another wrinkle to it as well. Um, you know, you all in Black Alliance for Peace have been mobilizing, you know, alongside the popular movement in Haiti for a number of months. You know, what are the, some of the connections that you see as well, Chris, between the popular struggles here in the United States uh, and the popular struggles in Haiti? There are definitely connections and the Haitian people, uh, grassroots organizations, they see those connections as well. Right now, because the situation is so tumultuous and everything is changing uh, minute by minute pretty much, uh, as well as this uh, state of martial law pretty much that, that has been imposed on the country, it is, um, I believe, going to be very, you know, a dangerous situation on the streets. But the Haitian people have always been courageous. They have always led us here in this hemisphere and taking action against imperialism and they're going to step up and they're going to you know struggle against this it's our responsibility here to support them and to you know highlight all everything that they're doing and try to coordinate our actions along with theirs uh with the uh, the black rebellion that was been taking place in the united states after the george floyd uh murder um in haiti at the same time there were a number of protests going on and connections were being made between uh, organizers here and organizers down there. And we'll continue to try to stay close to what's going on down there and to coordinate our actions with them. But I believe that the Haitian people are going to be courageous like they always have been. But we have to be vigilant. This state of, uh, state of siege that's been declared, which is just martial law, is to deter that, is to keep the Haitian people off the streets, to keep them from demanding their rights to, for demanding their sovereignty and for taking control of this political situation. And so that was put into place 
and for one reason, definitely to suppress that. Very well taken points. I definitely agree with with both of what you all were saying there. And certainly, you know, well, having brought it up once, I'll bring it up again in terms of the racism of the coverage about Haiti. Um, And, you know, Juan, who's also with us, we were talking quite a bit about this while we were there and just the dichotomy of what we were seeing in America and what we were seeing on the ground. But the thing that I, to me, um, Jamima, that felt so important to bring back to folks here was the depth of the social consciousness of the popular movement, which is just totally written out of all stories. But, you know, we're just picking random people out of the crowd and talking to them, and we're having great conversations, not just about imperialism, but about, you know, the need for a different type of model for Haiti. And it was... It was such a powerful vision that was coming from people there in the street, and it seems like that's a really important element of this. Well, definitely. And, you know, the... (laughs) The racism against Haiti has been has been consistent, right, in terms of thinking about Haiti um, from the 1915 occupation, you know, uh, well, from slavery, right? Uh, the enslavement, uh, the, the Haitian revolution was represented as a barbaric revolution of these black savages, you know, killing whites, right? And so we still have this language of chaos, I mean, just even like your leftist news said, you know, reported chaos in Haiti, you know, as if it's the Haitian people creating chaos. And so 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 part of that is, you know, it's a consistent anti-black and which is global and anti-blackness when it comes to representing Haiti. And Haiti then becomes like, you know, the the, the hyper black representation of, 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 of protest and, 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 and moves for self-determination. And so we know this and the Haitians know this. And I think we have to you know, those of us who want to go beyond these stereotypes and including, and I have to say, because I have to keep calling people out, whenever whenever you have Western reports in Haiti, they start with the poorest country, the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, right? As if the identity of Haitian people are the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, as opposed to the fact that it's this country that everybody wants to extract all kinds of resources, human and otherwise, minerals, oil, (laughs) right, Mm -hmm. Um, from Haiti, uh, you know, so 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 part of that we we have to understand how global white supremacy works when it comes to black and brown countries, right? And then their lives are seen as expendable, um, and 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 so and then that is used as well, right? Haitians are treated as children, as black savages that need to be rescued, and 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 that language it might not be specific, but all the other language, the NGOs, the international NGOs, the the IMF, the World Bank, these white you know institutions all treat Haiti in that way. And we have to understand that that treatment, you know, the the view of Haiti is very much part of the way that they, 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 um, they understand Haiti, the way that they approach Haiti and also the history of Haiti, which actually brought fear into white supremacy in 1804. Let's be real. And so that's the reality. And I think, and Haitians know this and, and, and they will always know it, even when people try to deny their own sense of their own, you know, tried to deny how much they know about themselves in their history and their position in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree 100%. I mean, it really is, even when you know, just being there, even for a brief amount of time, it just like hits you in the face how just absurd these representations are. But they are so, uh, perv- I mean, I remember the New York Times puts out this article when we're there, and it was unbelievable. The only Haitian interviewed was Jovenel. And the other people were all white Americans. And even, I won't say the person's name, one of the people who was quoted is someone who I actually know. And, you know, I appreciated their commentary. But I'm thinking, I, what what are you doing? I mean, and, and it's bylined Port-au-Prince. So I'm like, you here? I'm here. And you say you can't find one person who's not Jovenel who can speak on this. And just the fact that this is the so-called newspaper record in the United States, Rania, you know, we've been talking all show about the impact of, of media. Well, there you go. Yeah, I know Haiti is not, a, I wouldn't call it a poor country. It's an overexploited country. Uh, that's clearly a very rich country. It just hasn't been allowed to benefit from its own wealth uh, because it's just been extracted and uh, pulled out, whether that's labor or whether that's material wealth. I mean, it's just, it's really stunning to to hear what you just said, though, about the New York Times while you were there. Eugene, I remember when you were in Haiti, and I, I didn't see 
any other outlets on the ground. I think I saw like one very mediocre and not very well done Vice documentary, which is to be expected. Um, and we, and we actually heard, we actually heard, we went to some of the places that Vice went and people were telling us like, oh yeah, we saw that Vice <laughs> news because they came in and they told people like, yeah, we're going to tell your story and we're going to do this, that, and the third. And then it's just this ridiculous, sensational piece that put the the popular movement essentially on the same footing as Jovenel and and the same footing as the gangs and you know and in a way it just shows how just absurd these reports are because it's almost like they didn't expect Haitians to see it like we're just going to tell all these lies and no one will ever know because only Americans watch Vice but yeah I will say to their credit Al Jazeera was the only outlet I saw that seemed to be like on the ground. I think their coverage has been so-so, but I at least saw them out places. But many media that that week we were there, that was Byline Port-au-Prince, they were reporting from the hotel. I don't care what anyone says, we didn't I, see them anywhere, they were reporting from the hotel. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to media coverage of these places, it's also such a an interesting juxtaposition because like three right wingers will hold a protest in Venezuela and every single American media outlet puts their camera on those three people and makes a really big deal. And Oh my God, they're repressed. It just shows you what an arm of the state department. Most of these Western media outlets are because in the case of Haiti, you had these massive protests, but they happen to be against a U.S. backed right wing neoliberal regime. And whenever that's the case, you know, it's just not important whether it's in Colombia whether it's in Haiti, but then when it's in Venezuela and it's a bunch of right-wingers burning down like medical clinics, or if it's in Nicaragua or whatever the case may be, I mean, it's the exact polar opposite. So, and, and I think that's a perfect note to say, like, this is one reason why Breakthrough News exists. And I'm really proud to be a part of Breakthrough News because you were able to be there. And I'm glad that we can have this panel because just watching the discussions about Haiti, it's everybody becomes an expert overnight. Everybody, but the New York Times and the Washington Posts and all these other smaller outlets, they're all suddenly experts on Haiti when there's an assassination that happens and it's in the news. But in a few days, it's going to be out of the news and no one's mm. going to be talking about it anymore. And in mm. those in-between moments, no one understands the context of what's happening and how we got here. Well, I think it speaks so much to what you were saying, Chris, which is that we have the responsibility then to raise these issues up and to put them in front of people. Definitely. You know, one of the things and I think, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I really quickly, I just really quickly wanted to shout out uh, someone in the super chat oh, yeah. uh, threw in some money. And once again, those who are watching, if you're, if you're, if you're in the chat, you can throw in money in the super chat and we'll read your comment on air. Uh, <laughs> Rath, I don't even know how to pronounce this person's name because it's not a name. It's literally Rathweight Bonus, Bone Spurs Quacker Bush. Well, shout out to you. Uh, the, <laughs> he says he or she or they says Haiti is used as a testing ground for American imperialism. Haitian citizens are always on the losing end, except, of course, for the elites. Uh, couldn't agree more with that. Mm hmm. Go you know, you, Gene. I'm sorry, I didn't want to. No, 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 it's fine. It's important. Shout out to our super chat. Shout out to everyone who's watching. Thank you for watching and for sharing this because it is important that people know. You know, another issue that I wanted to, to raise, Jamima, and this is, um, you know, one that I think has been maybe miscovered, but that is the security situation. And I mean, obviously, I think people are hearing a lot about the government now. Um, you know, the issue of the, the gangs has also been an issue. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the relationship of forces on the ground uh, in terms of, you know, I guess the various armed forces that are at play. Right. Um, that's a very difficult thing to talk about because there's so many different elements. There are gangs that are supported. And we have to say there's a history of uh, the, the light-skinned elite um, in Haiti arming young, you know, unemployed men to go do their bidding, right? And so you, you have the history of that. But you also have over the past uh, um, year or so just an increasing number of weapons being handed out to young people all over. And you have to ask yourself, when well, you see these young boys, these young with these huge machine guns, all the ammunition in a poor country, right? Where, um, where are these guns are coming from? And we have to think, well, they come, you know, there are these stories that show up in the news. It's like that CIA Coke um, um, boat that just disappeared from the news that has a boat full of, full of Coke. Not CIA, it was like a bank 
that mm-hmm. I had coke. But but my point is, is like these guns being found at these ports, and these ports are privately owned by the elite families, right? And so you wonder how they get into the country because there's an arms embargo in Haiti, you know. So we have to think about well, who's funding the gangs? So some people, some of them are linked to that. Some of them are linked to the the bourgeoisie, and, and we don't know. And the situation on the ground is very flexible. And especially now you have shifting alliances and so on. So it's just very difficult to really grasp who's who's with whom, who isn't, especially when alliances are, are, are shifting. And so I, I we've been trying to, in, at the Black Alliance for Peace to really be careful be, in, in making pronouncements about very specific, these specific uh, groups and gangs on, on the ground, except to say that we have to figure out who's funding them, where they're getting the money, and why it is that, you know, these young men are being given these amazing, these crazy weapons to go and massacre um, one another. So it is, it's, it's an explosive situation. It's changing by the day. And I think we just need to really keep in mind, um, you know, keep an eye out for, for what's going to happen. But also we keep an eye out on what it is that the, the U.S., the international community really allows under its watch. And, and, and we know that the other thing I, I, I'm worried about is, you know, that Closer Jeff just had a press conference asking the international community for help in dealing with the gang problem. And that already tells you, if we think about, you know, if we talk about linkages between what's going on in the U.S. and and Haiti, it's just thinking about, you know, like the gang war, you know, the the police going after the gangs in in like L.A. and, and stuff like that and what that means in terms of like regular life for folks. And, 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 you know, the, the, what's going to happen to regular Haitians on the ground when they, it's going to be a militarized response. And so he's already asking for this foreign help to deal with the gangs. And so that's, that's our position is to actually be concerned about that, that, that part of it. That's not to diminish, you know, the, the, the brutality of the, the violence that's been happening. But we also think the violence is really linked to these very specific Parties, people with power, using using these young men who are unemployed um, for for their own um, for their own gain. Yeah, no, I mean it's really when you see all these American-made weapons. I mean weapons that aren't even easy to get in the U.S., which you know you could get a gun on every corner. Uh, it really does raise a lot of questions about what's going on, and and I think ties so much to the earlier point you were making about how chaos and all these other things are thrown out there as if it's just congenital and there's no, it's just randomly happening. And how could this, this is just violent, random all over the place when it, well, nowhere on earth. people are so violent, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you think it's some of the people who are considered authorities, I mean, to see Yvonne Duque talking about, oh, we got to do something <laughs> about the violence in Haiti. You got the most violent country in the Americas. Y'all are steady killing people, the most brutal police. But it does sort of speak, I think, you know, to who this, so-called government is, uh, you know, which is if you look at to the Yvonne Duques of the world for your security policy, um, no surprise. Uh, our, our friend Braithwaite, who gave us another ten dollars, was hoping to hear about the Clinton Foundation's atrocities in Haiti. We'll be here Woo! for another thirty time, years. I don't know, Jamima, if you do want to speak to that though, because it, it is very, very notable the role that that the Clintons have played. Yes, yeah, you know, I do want, I, and, and I don't know, Chris, if you want, jump in um, if you want, but. Um, I do want to say, I do blame Hillary Clinton directly and the Obama administration for what's happening, what's happened in Haiti for the past decade. Because it was Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State that left the Middle East during the Arab Spring and flew to Haiti and forced the Electoral Commission and the people there to accept Michel Martelly as the running candidate when he did not even make the first round of the elections. So it was the Clint, it was Hillary Clinton um, and Obama that foisted this new party, the PHTK, upon the Haitian people and forced these elections. And that's this is why we are where we are today. And it was also Bill Clinton who was headed, you know, was part of the recovery mission and who gave away all, who created all kinds of corruption, you know, in dealing with the, the elite in Haiti, gave them all this money to build hotels and, and, and raise their wealth on the backs of poor Haitians. And so, yes, the Clinton Foundation are corrupt and really in these, for me, I think are war criminals. And I think the U.S. government, these presidents are very much should be at the ICC for what they have done to Haitian people, at least in the last 17 years, but especially in the last decade. So that's what I have to say about Bill and Hillary Clinton 
because I'm so upset. I And I know this is live and I need to keep my mouth shut because there's so much I can say um, about those two, but also about Obama, right? Which is because this is this is Obama's gift to Haiti. This this um, Tet Kale party that has been completely, you know, terrorizing the people for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Chris, your thoughts on the same issue? Exactly. This latest batch of neo-colonial rulers was given to us by Hillary and Bill Clinton. Uh, they're primarily responsible for Martelly. And by extension, Martelly handpicked Jovenel Moise. And now we have uh, Claude Joseph. So this situation, this current situation that Haiti is, the people of Haiti are suffering under is due to U.S. foreign policy directly. And we can see the direct connections like uh, Jamima mentioned. I mean, it really is the level and the of complicity of the U.S. on so many different levels is, I mean, it's, in many ways it, it is known, maybe to some it's obvious, but I feel, you know, the Clintons and others masquerading as these humanitarian figures. I mean, I just, I was thinking that the whole time I was there, you know, and we were only there for eight days, but uh, even in that time, of all the commercials I was seeing late at night in 2010 in the wake of the earthquake, give money to this person, give money to that person, we're going to go to Haiti, we're going to help Haiti, and I'm just like, whatever happened to that money? What did they ever do with that? I mean, it's obvious that it didn't get to the people on the ground. I mean, it really is just a travesty on every level. Well, I want to say thanks to both of you. I really appreciate you giving us our time. Also really want to shout out Black Alliance for Peace and definitely check out uh, at Blacks for Peace on Twitter. I'm only on Twitter, social media, but a lot of great resources that Black Alliance for Peace is putting out and has put out to help people understand what's really going on there. But Chris, Jamima, really appreciate y'all joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.